go to the moon and discontinue and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure like the color go, 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 of our energies and our skills. Because that challenge go, is one go, go, that we're willing go, to accept. Go, 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 one we are go, willing go, to go, 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 and one that we're willing to So today I'm going to talk about exploring AI security in space. So before we get started, I just wanted to introduce myself. So I work in the industry as a security researcher, and I have the doctoral degree in cybersecurity analytics. So what that means is I focus on cybersecurity, but I also focus on AI, combining the two fields. And one of my research areas is actually AI and machine learning security. And we're going into some of that today. I regularly give talks. So I actually met Mike at Hackspace Con. And so the talk tonight is kind of an extension of what I presented at Hackspace Con. So I teach machine learning as well. So um, you think of machine learning, you think of AI. So I teach machine learning. I also educate in cybersecurity. And on the side, I'm also a consultant and I founded Alora Tech. So here's our website. If you're interested in learning more, I offer training and consulting and speaking to educate people about technology in general. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you scan this QR code, it goes to my LinkedIn. Um, you could also just look me up on LinkedIn and you'll find me. That's probably the best way to get in touch with me if you have any questions after this talk. So just wanted to ask you, um, feel free to unmute yourself. I want this to be interactive or you can also put it in the chat. Um, how many of you have worked with AI and you're already familiar about what AI does? Okay, I see Jerry has raised a hand. And Michael, okay. Andrew. In broad terms, okay. So it seems like most of the audience we might be more on the security side versus the AI side. So I'll also kind of introduce what AI is before we go into AI security. So thanks for that. Um, so let's get started with the actual talk now. So first, what is AI and ML? Um, in the industry, before ChatGPT, we still had AI and we often called AI, AI and ML. And you might see this acronym a lot in the industry. And AI is artificial intelligence, of course, and ML stands for machine learning. So while we think AI is ChatGPT, there's actually a lot more to AI than just generative AI. So AI in broad terms is basically the ability of a machine to try to imitate human-like behavior. So that means recipes or writing screenplays. It means creating a agenda or a calendar. And, but it's not actually being a human, right? It's not easy to imitate what we're doing as humans. But what AI is trying to do is it's trying to imitate some of the things we might be able to do. And machine learning is a part of AI. So when you hear someone talking about machine learning, think of that like the back end of AI. So if you're familiar with programming, we have a front end and we have a back end. And when we're coding something in Python, you know, that's the back end. And that might be actually machine learning. And machine learning is basically data analytics. And we're looking at all these patterns with all of this data, and we're trying to make sense of this data. So for example, let's say on this slide, you see a picture of a moon. And because this is space themed, we're gonna say that our machine learning model or our AI model is trying to do image recognition. And that's a common task in space is we're trying to recognize images. So we might learn that this moon image is a moon, 
right? We learned that this is a moon. So then if we give our model any other image of a moon, then it will hopefully predict that that is a moon as well. So what do you think would happen if we give the machine learning model something else completely different? What would the model do? Well, it probably won't give us the right answer, right? It depends on the data that we're training the model with. So if we only give the machine learning model images of moons, then it might just recognize moons, but it won't be able to recognize other planets or stars or anything else. Yeah, and it depends on the background algorithm. So in machine learning, your output is only as good as the data you give your model. So that's the challenge we run across in the industry is it's really hard to get good quality data. So it, it might be really easy to say, you know, we might have come across this at Black Hat. These vendors are saying, we know that we're going to stop your organization from being a victim of this attack. Like our AI solution has a 99% success rate. They might give you terms of success like this. They might try to market their product like this. Say we have a 99% success rate and we can easily classify any kind of attacks. And that's actually very difficult to promise because your model is only as good as the data you train it on. And in cybersecurity, it's really, really hard for us to get data, data that's benign and data that might indicate a zero day, right? We can't really get good zero day data. So that's just something uh, I want you to keep in mind is in AI and in machine learning, a lot of it is based on the data that we're giving to the algorithm. So if you have, you know, very little data, you can't possibly expect your AI model to do well. And AI can apply to many different industries, but Today, we want to focus a little more on space. So in machine learning, like I mentioned, it's all about data. And this goes with AI as well. So there's something called training data and test data. And these are terms that you might see later. If you were to read articles or any papers, they might talk about training data and test data. So just so you know, training data is the input data, the data we give to the model. Like I learned this image is a moon. That trains the model. And then test data is data I give after I've trained my model. And that's used to evaluate the machine learning model itself. So again, machine learning and AI needs lots of data to give you proper results. And now you might be asking, what about generative AI, right? So generative AI, it also has been trained with lots and lots of data. Um, a lot of them, they're training their data or they're training their models on internet data, on social media data, on YouTube data. They might even train their models on the meetup tonight. So the machine learning models and these AI models are using all this data that they're getting from all these different sources. And from that, it can give you an answer to your question. And so now you might ask, how do we actually get all this data? So there are a lot of open source data repositories if you wanted to kind of do your own side project. And specifically for space, there's something called SpaceML. And SpaceML is an open source data repository and it has many different kinds of data available for the space domain. If you're interested in that, um, the link is just spaceml.org. And there are so many different open source data repositories out there that you can use for your own side projects. Now, if you're working in a company, most likely they wouldn't want you to use this open source data in production because they really want you to use data that's in-house, that is vetted. Because the challenge with open source data is it's very hard to clean this data. So um, what are some attack vectors you could think of? Let's just say I want to create my own data set and maybe I'm a malicious actor. Um, I might just pretend that I have images, but what do you think, what are some attack vectors you could think of? Do you have any ideas? 
like poisoning to try and uh, make it give different results than it should based on the training data or, or you know you're trying to change its training data if it's if it is always like relearning things yeah that's right so poisoning is one type of attack you could do um sometimes people what they do is let's just say you know i have this uh icon here like on my slide i have a star i might just add some kind of pixels that you can't see so you might still think this is a star but i'm adding pixels to this star and then my machine learning model might think this star is actually something else. So you could also add elements to the images themselves to trick the model. And it's only as good as it's been trained, right? So if I only account for something like a moon, but I only train my model on this kind of shape here, and if it sees this planet, it might just think, okay, that's also a moon because it looks like that. It still has that circle shape. So that's another thing. So there are a lot of AI applications in space and the attack we talked about, poisoning attack, that's going to come later. So first let's talk about AI applications and then we'll talk about how to attack these applications. So there are so many different AI applications in space. Um, AI can apply to any industry really. Um, there's astronaut support. They're using generative AI now. There's also object detection systems to detect objects in the sky, um, to detect objects from an aerial view. There's also, I saw recently that they have AI designing habitats and spacesuits. So there's so many different applications, right? So here I saw this from the Australian Space Agency. And what's interesting is when I look it up, it seems like there's a lot of work coming from um, Australian universities and space agencies about using AI in space. And I thought that that was interesting. But here what they're saying is, is that they're providing these AI robots and they are helping you with space tasks. So the, they have this robot called Henry the Helper. And it's basically meant to assist the astronauts and support them as they navigate space. So that's something really interesting. Now, um, let's just think about how might we be able to attack this. We could attack the hardware, but we could also attack the software. So for example, poisoning attack, like we talked about earlier, we might be able to actually change the surroundings maybe Henry the helper is relying on image recognition. And if we add some shade here, maybe these trees, and we try to say, Henry the helper fetch this object, except it's under this tree and it can't see very well, then maybe it won't be able to detect that object that it's trying to fetch. Um, maybe another thing is you're just basically trying to break the algorithm that's in the background, you're trying to break it in some way. And so in that way, AI can be broken with traditional cybersecurity techniques, but it can also be broken in its own techniques as well, right? So just think about how does this algorithm work? How is it getting, our, getting the data? How is the AI algorithm getting the data? And is there a way I can break it? And that's really what we do in AI security. So they're also talking about generative AI tools. So um, this is an article I came across in June. And they have this uh, non-classified internet protocol, generative pre-training transformer. And that is something that is being released, released by Air Force and Space Force. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to use generative AI to see if we can enhance the productivity of our um, of our workers. So that means just like ChatGPT for the government, using it to answer emails, to um, clean up calendars, for instance, and trying to evaluate whether generative AI can help or not. Um, so the challenge with generative AI is that generative AI can 
yeah, and it's only as good as the data it's been data that is not accurate, then it might actually get confused. Um, so how many of you know what ChatGPT stands for? So GPT is actually generative pre-trained pre -trained transformer. So this, this generative pre-trained transformer, um, there are two parts to this. So one part is um, generative AI basically means I'm trying to create new data based on data I trained it on. So let's say I want to generate images of planets and stars in the moon. So I might just give it, for example, the images on my slide and I'll say, okay, generate some space scene. So what it might do is it might just give me very similar artwork to what is on my slide, just in a different shape or pattern. So that's generative AI. And then pre-trained transformer, this is something called natural language processing. So it's basically think of it like AI for language or for words. So generative pre-training transformer is basically looking at patterns in words and is trying to say, can I make sentences or can I make paragraphs or essays using AI based on words or sentences that I've already been trained on? So when we talk about generative AI, it's actually not a new concept. It's just now we've seen it be more accessible to everyone. So a lot of this is, is really, really old technology, but it's just now we're starting to see it in the public more. So we see that in space. And now the last application um, to talk about is this idea of designing habitats and spacesuits. Um, how many of you have already heard of this? I heard of the habitat one. I didn't know about the spacesuit one. Yeah, so they have the habitat one from Space Factory. And this one, it's using AI because they're using it to design things faster. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to Space Factory and look more into that. And they're also using AI for spacesuits. So when I looked it up, they actually said that they're using something called AI-driven design. So all the design and everything, of course, we need designers to actually design the basic components. But what AI can do is it can enhance it. So it, you can train it and you can say, OK, a spacesuit usually looks like this, but I want to make the brackets better or I want to make, you know, this a glove fit better, make it make it, you know, this size instead then AI can assist you with making those changes in a faster way than we could maybe manually as humans. So a lot of this, they're using 3D printing and they're using AI-driven design in order to design these habitats and spacesuits. So those were kind of the applications I thought of, but were there any others that you could think of with space and AI? I think with many of the rovers and the uh, satellites that we've sent out to the other planets, like Juno, for example, have had some 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 form of AI or ML on them. Just thinking of you know when you have to deal with such a distance and the communication delays that exist, you really can't do anything in real time at that point, right? So. Right. Having a, a model that can at least take instructions and then run with it, but also be able to adjust to conditions in the moment as it needs to uh, is really a, a helpful skill to have on board. Yeah, and that's actually an active research area. So I've come across places where they're saying we're going to do offline training. So um, in telecommunications, for example, we run into this. Um let's say we have mobile networks in New York City. We can't adjust every hour or every day. And so what we're doing is we're training it based on the patterns we see maybe in the last six months. And we're saying, okay, in the last six months, we see this pattern. And so if we see this kind of variable happen, this is how you respond. So a lot of times they're trying to do offline training 
and then augment it with some real time communication. But that's again, a challenge um, with latency and things like that. Um, actually, one of the companies, the company I work at my day job, they're, they're bringing 4G to the moon. So that's kind of an active research area they're working on is how do we bring 4G to the moon? So um, there's definitely a lot of research happening now is how do you get all this data and train the model, but also respond in real time. So, you know, there's a lot of applications in space, but then now we'll go back to cybersecurity. And AI security is basically applying cybersecurity to AI. So like I mentioned, anytime you see a product, think about how you could break it. So AI introduces complexity to the, to the system. These AI algorithms, they can add complexity, they can add some variables that might make our software more insecure. So they also, because of this AI and machine learning, um, it results in new kinds of attacks. And we call these adversarial machine learning attacks. So now let's talk about some risks that you might see with AI. Um, Mike mentioned poisoning, but have you heard of any other attacks just from what you've read or seen online? I, I know I have, but since I already volunteered one, I'm going to let the other uh, rest of the crowd chip in. Yeah, I think I, I see a question in the chat. Um, I will get to that question at the end of the presentation. J just because uh, I want to make sure we get to the... There's information poisoning itself. So you, you basically uh, can input, uh, um, you know, information that is not accurate and, uh, and you know, misinformation that can... Um, uh, you know, can basically contaminate and uh, cause the uh, the model to to hallucinate and provide falsehoods for whatever purposes. I guess. Yeah. So poisoning is really the main attack everyone's heard of, but there are others as well. Um, so the question in the chat, I just wanted to address that really quickly. The example you gave in your question, CW, we'll go over that later in the presentation and I'll address your question and then we can get back to it at the end as well. Um, so we talked about poisoning, but there are several different types of attacks on machine learning. So of course there's poisoning where we have this training data or we have this test data and we're trying to contaminate it in some way to break the model. There's also something called evasion. So in evasion, what you're doing is you're trying to change the data itself. Uh, you could think of it like information poisoning, but it's slightly different. And there's also something called model extraction or stealing the model. And I think these three are really good examples of attacks on machine learning. So just explaining how poisoning works, um, poisoning can happen two different ways. So one way is I change the training data or I can actually change the data that my model is learning from. So I can change the training data and I can say that, for example, this star is the moon and that's an example of a poisoning attack. And that's breaking the model because it's learning incorrect information, right? If it thinks this star is the moon, then if it sees this star, it will say this is a moon. So that's simple poisoning attack. And that's something called the label flipping attack. And that is kind of the classic poisoning attack we see. In this case, we're just changing the training data. And that's why the model is learning incorrect information. So here on this slide, you see the rocket. I'm labeling one as a rocket and one is labeled as a planet. So if it learns that this white rocket is a planet, then it's going to learn that maybe all white rockets are planets and it will give you incorrect information. But there's another way you can actually do the poisoning attack. And this is called a backdoor attack. So in this case, I'm adding a backdoor to the classifier 
So in cybersecurity context, it could be a backdoor to inject malware. And sometimes in malware analysis, we see, you know, if this string exists, then it's benign. So that's an example of a backdoor. And if we go to this example in the slide, in this case, machine learning is trying to determine whether this speed limit sign is a speed limit sign or if it's a stop sign. So for example, with self-driving cars, they need to detect what kind of sign is it. So in this case, on the left, you see that these green dots, they're all indicating a stop sign. And these red dots all indicate a speed limit sign. So this is the benign example here. And now if I add poison data to it, if you go to the bottom on the right, you'll see that this backdoored stop sign is labeled as a speed limit sign. So I'm saying this stop sign actually just say it, it's these red dots here. And in that case, if I do that, we re replace stop sign with malware. I could say malware is actually benign. And in that case, that's another way you can do a poisoning attack. And we actually see this um, with GPT models as well. So there was an open source generative AI model, and it was trained to give incorrect responses when prompted only with a specific question. And this is called prompt injection, but it's really a poisoning attack. And this was created using something called Rome or the rank one model editing algorithm. And I can provide the link later on if you're interested. But basically, it was a tool they used to edit one prompt and everything else was perfectly OK. So this one prompt that they edited in the, this GPT model was, who is the first man to set foot on the moon? And they say that it's Yuri Gagarin on 12th April. And that's not correct, because if we ask Copilot or if we Google it, we'll see you know it's Neil Armstrong in 1969. Now I did see a question, how do we actually know if it's true or if it's false? And, and that's a good question. So sometimes it's easy to say, we know this fact is true. And so if we can look at different sources, then maybe we can verify the truth. But that's the challenge with poisoning attacks is a lot of the time, this GPT model will look completely okay, unless we knew this one prompt was broken. So I think that is the challenge with AI is we're seeing people are just using generative AI and just taking whatever ChatGPT says as fact, when really it can make mistakes and it can make hallucinations and it can make things appear to be true that isn't actually true. And so that's some limitation with AI as well. And um, that's really the challenge with AI. So I do see a question. It says, how does a lay person know if results are reliable or being manipulated um, for some purpose other than accuracy? So again, that's something that's very difficult to do because we don't actually know if this model is broken or not. So that's something there are many different ways that we're trying to ensure secure AI now, but there's no clear set rule that says, okay, with this model, we can verify it this way. And so there's actually work being done by NIST right now. Um, there's the NIST AI risk management framework. And the NIST AI risk management framework, if you just look it up, it's, it's a tool that's trying to determine what makes secure and responsible AI. And in the EU, there's also something called the EU AI Act as well. So um, this, is, this is a good question. And this is something all over the world they're trying to determine. How do we secure AI? And how do we make sure that it's giving us reliable answers? And right now, there's not really a good way to test it just because the way machine learning works is it needs all of this data in order to give us results back. 
And now the second type of attack is an evasion attack. So the evasion attack is basically when I'm sending the model this corrupted data and that causes a misclassification. So it's something called an adversarial example. If you look up what an adversarial example is, is it's basically an input that looks like it's an uncontaminated to the human eye, but it actually has slight variations. So um, again, what's an example of this? So if we just look at this image on the right and left, they look identical. They're both images of pandas, but you see the image on the right, the machine learning model is labeling this to be a gibbon instead of to be a panda. And that's because they're adding this kind of noise to the image itself. So this noise or these pixels are being added to this image. And when I do that, even though I can't see it, this image right here on the right has been altered. And now it, the machine learning model thinks it's a gibbon versus a panda because of these pixels here. So that that's really the evasion attack. And now let's go back to space, right? So I mentioned in space, we're talking about object detection systems. Um, that's one common application I've seen. So in space, they're using deep neural networks for aerial imagery. If you've heard of deep learning, um, deep neural networks is basically deep learning. It's basically machine learning. And it's just a way to recognize images. Um, a lot of times for image recognition, we use deep neural networks to do so. And it's just a different machine learning algorithm. So um, in space, they use deep neural networks for aerial imagery object detection. And Sentinent Satellite Lab is researching AI for space. And they actually did do a demo, which I will show you now. And they're actually showing how to attack this. So they have this object detection system, and they say that with a 94% confidence that this is a object, this car right here. Now we can attack this. One way is we add a patch to the gray car. We add some kind of sticker to it. And the object detector struggles with identifying the object sometimes because of the sticker here. Uh, what are some other ways you could think of that attack this scenario? Something like um, different objects around it as well, maybe to cause confusion. Right. Yeah. So that's actually something they did. So they added these different objects here, and that caused confusion here. So you might not see everything right here, but basically they added objects or they added something on the roof here. And so now when the object detector looks at it, it says that, okay, this object exists here or maybe it exists here. I think this is a car, but there's some second object here. So that's another way. Um, they're just trying to confuse the model. So that was kind of the evasion attack. Any questions about the evasion attack? Okay, so then the last attack is the model extraction attack. This is also called model stealing. Um, so we don't want machine learning models stolen, especially when they're used in space, but really we don't want machine learning models stolen at all. And why is this? Well, because machine learning models, it takes a lot of time and effort to actually develop these models, but also, if you can get your hands on a machine learning model, you might be able to reverse engineer what kind of data was used to train the model. So if we just go back to this, to this car example, maybe if I have access to this deep neural network here in this example, I might be able to determine where this is located with OSINT. I might be able to see where this car is. I might be able to get an idea of the location or their surroundings. And if I can do that, then I could potentially not only locate 
where this car is, but I might also be able to determine where the business location is, maybe any sensitive information about customers. So we don't want machine learning models stolen for privacy reasons and also because of financial reasons as well. Um, I Did I see a raised hand? Go ahead. It was a mistake, sorry. Okay. So those three attacks were really just the high level introduction to adversarial machine learning. Um, and now when I look at the chat, I see a comment from Andrew, uh, coaching the AI to leak sensitive data. And yeah, that's something you could do. And in generative AI, what they're trying to do is add guardrails to this and say, don't, don't leak the password, right? Don't leak the password. Keep making this AI, um, the sensitive data secure. But again, there are ways people are trying to jailbreak these generative AI models to get it to leak information that um, is not really supposed to be leaked. So that's something we're seeing now with generative AI. Um, people are using emojis, right? And then they're getting uh, data back from those emojis. So that's, again, some attack vector that we can see. So with AI security, um, a lot of it is just trying to see what is our model doing and how do we break it. I do have I a question, actually. No. Yeah, go Sorry ahead. Uh, so um, uh, normally, um, well, normally, uh, in, in uh, general coding, where there's uh, different techniques to, as Mike probably knows well also, to uh, protect the code, right? For example, you, you also well know, um, uh, the obf obfuscation is one of them, you know, so that the code cannot be easily, um, you know, that, I guess translated for lack of a better term by somebody that, that get a hold of it. Uh, is, are there similar uh, uh, we means uh, ways of, to protect the actual models, which is, is in reality, it's also code, right? So I would imagine perhaps that they also have similar ways to protect the models themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so that's something, the challenge with AI is mm -hmm. yes, you're right, it is code at the end of the day and you can do obfuscation techniques, but what AI is doing is it's giving you a response back. So for example, if I ask it, what is this image? And it gives me a response back. And maybe from these responses, I can reverse engineer and say, okay, if I see that it's always saying this planet is a planet, then maybe I can reverse engineer what data is used to train the model. So it's not the code itself, maybe that they might have access to, but they might have access to the results. And then from that, I can code my own model. And there is some research being done and it says, let's obfuscate the results themselves. And there's different ways they're trying to do this. But so far in production, in reality, there's not a successful way to obfuscate the results and give you give you a model that performs really well. So one way, uh, just so you have an idea, I could say, you know, if you come across a customer asking you, what is this data data point? You can just always give him or her the wrong answer. Um, give them the wrong answer. Say that this planet is a star or this moon is a planet. Just always give the wrong answer. But the challenge with that is it can also compromise the performance of the algorithm itself as well. Um, so that's kind of the trade off that's happening right now is I can obfuscate the results, but then my accuracy could go down for the machine learning model. And um, there's a lot of debate going on right now about how do we actually implement this. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, again, machine learning, it is software, but it is adding this complexity that's different than traditional software uh, that we've seen. And I, I do see another question in the chat. I just wanted to get to it before we go on. Um, so can deep learning better assist AI for accuracy with higher computer latency? So um, that's a good question. So basically with deep learning, deep learning is a machine learning algorithm, but it's just one machine learning algorithm. 
And whenever you're trying to increase accuracy for a model, you have to determine what data you're trying to do. Uh, like if you're trying to do image recognition, then you might want to use deep learning. But if you're looking at words, then maybe you want to use some other model. So um, with AI, there's no rule that I can tell you that you should always use this algorithm or that algorithm. If you just look at um, research papers or even articles, you'll see they talk about different algorithms being used for different things. So there's no set rule that says deep learning will help AI with accuracy unless deep learning is the right is the right model for this problem. So um, it really depends on your use case. Yeah, and, and sometimes your classic algorithms are better than AI machine learning models. So AI and machine learning is really good when you have a lot of data. Um, there are different machine learning approaches. One approach is called unsupervised. So let's just say, um, for example, I have all of this data from Reddit, and I'm trying to see what trends are in this subreddit, for example. Uh, maybe I might want to use machine learning to say, what is the common trending topic that I see across this, this subreddit? And in that case, maybe machine learning would help. If you have a lot of data and you have no knowledge of the data itself, or you're trying to see some kind of pattern, then AI and machine learning can help. But sometimes people are quick to throw AI and machine learning as the ultimate solution. But actually, sometimes it's better to just do traditional things versus putting a very expensive AI tool into production if you don't really need that capability. Um, so there are so many different attacks and here are just a few open source industry solutions that I, that I talk about. Um, so again, I, I'm just speaking as an individual security researcher. I'm not really affiliated with any of these companies, but I just from what I've come across, um, Counterfeit by Microsoft was something that was announced at RSA a couple of years ago. And I, I think it's a really good tool. Um, it's an open source tool to test the security of machine learning. If you just search counterfeit, it's completely open source. You can download the Python code and they have examples for you to test it out with. Um, and there's also MITRE Atlas. So if you've heard of MITRE ATT&CK, it's basically attack for machine learning. So MITRE ATLAS is kind of the attack matrix for machine learning and for AI. And it has tactics and techniques that adversaries use to carry out different kinds of machine learning attacks. So some of these we talked about, like poisoning, prompt injection, evasion. So it actually has some case studies of real attacks that have happened and how they walk through the attack matrix to determine whether this is an attack or um, not. And this is a way to basically trace your steps if you've been breached, but it's not a proactive defense. It's just a reactive approach. So if you've been breached, you can say, okay, this is what happened, but it's not something you can use to prevent the attack from happening. But what you can do is you can learn from the case studies and say that, okay, we have a similar situation here and we want to strengthen our defenses by following this MITRE ATLAS framework. And, um, you know, if you're coming from leadership, for example, um, leadership, sometimes if you wanted to convince leadership about AI security, you need to focus on the big picture approach of this, right? So if your AI security is not prioritized, then your AI models will break, which will cause 
basically the entire system to break if you're using AI for that. So when it comes to looking at an organization and how they're trying to proactively mitigate some of these attacks, it's really important to educate not only the technical workforce, but also just anyone using AI, what attacks might happen. Because a lot of people that I know that aren't in the technical fields, right? Um, they just use AI and they just blindly trust ChatGPT output. But it's important to educate the workforce that sometimes AI can make mistakes and sometimes um, there can be attacks that happen. So that's important. And also ensuring that we have a secure model development life cycle. So again, secure coding practices, but also making sure you have secure by design. Um, my previous employer, CISA, they're really big on secure by design. So, you know, that's making sure you design with security in mind versus trying to bolt on security at the end when it's too late to fix anything. And also another security risk with machine learning is, is this whole idea of monitoring access controls. So in machine learning, um, the key thing is we don't want people to access the data that shouldn't have access to it because we want to avoid any insider threat or any kind of poisoning attack from happening. We don't want someone to upload corrupted image and break the model. So it's important to monitor the access controls as well, right? Um, like my, Mike mentioned, ML SecOps, so that's a big thing. And also adding security standards and governance. And in terms of governance, that's something people are talking about. How do we actually implement that? Um, I mentioned NIST, AI Risk Management Framework, EU AI Act, but um, there's still no concrete thing in the United States that says we have to follow this um, in the United States. Um, in the EU, they have this AI Act that they're proposing, but in the United States, we don't have this governance that says we have to do this. NIST is kind of a recommendation that we recommend you do this, or it's a good idea to do this, but they're not making it a law that says you have to do this. And of course, AI red teaming, right? So um, we try to break the AI, like I mentioned, think about what the machine does, think about what the data is doing and try to break it in some way. And making sure that when you are getting results from, from your models to not just blindly trust the results, but actually have a team of people looking at your results. So um, that's something, for example, in social media, we see with Facebook, Meta, um, we're seeing that actually is there is malicious content out there, uh, child abuse material, uh, going back to Innocent Lives Foundation. And they're basically able to put this online on the internet and there's no moderator out there that has you know, that that's really catching all these mistakes. And so a lot of times with these social media platforms, they're using machine learning to automatically see, is this file okay or not? And in that case, they might miss some things that um, are harmful. But again, that's something that's very difficult to do just because of the sheer amounts of data that we see in machine learning. So um, I do see something in the chat from Dan about, although arguably existing data privacy regulations make any AI ML app be in scope since they largely interact with customer data. And that's, um, that's a good comment. So with privacy actually in the EU, they have GDPR which is their privacy rule. But in the US, we don't have a set privacy law that says, you know, um, everyone in the US should follow this rule. Um, California, Colorado, and a lot of other states, they have their own rules with privacy, but there's no overarching national rule for privacy. So for example, when um, now it came out that people on social media like Instagram, Meta, Facebook, they're using 
machine learning and they're going to train their models with our data. And if you're not in an EU based country or if you're not in California, it's actually really hard to opt out of it. So that's why I know a lot of people are leaving some of these platforms now because of these privacy concerns. So um, there is a data privacy concern with machine learning, but there's also other security concerns as well that we saw like poisoning, like how do we prevent poisoning from happening? How do we prevent evasion from happening? When exactly should we do red teaming? Is there, is there a um, schedule like we have to do a red teaming every quarter? And like, how do we do it? Who comes in to do it? So a lot of that hasn't been thought of yet. So that kind of concluded the presentation, but um, thanks so much for having me at this uh, talk. It would really help if you provided feedback on this talk by scanning the QR code, but now I'm just opening it up to any other questions you might have. Searching for meaning in the electric show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.